Thank you, everyone. So I'd like to speak a little bit today about um, forecasting in the wind, en wind energy sector. And basically, um, my background is in lower atmosphere dynamics and traditionally in connection to the land surface and starting to move into looking at um, wind energy issues. So just for a little bit of context as we start off this section, um, wind energy has, over the last several years, been the fastest growing component in the renewal, renewable energy mix. Um, these slides, as this field's moving rather quickly, are a bit dated, but a few years ago, the suggestions were that it would be moving to about 20% of the electricity um, supply by 2030. But the important point of what I want to talk about is that wind energy generation or the potential varies dramatically in both space and time. So we're looking at the temporal fluctuations that are necessary in, um, in investing in, operating, trading, and maintaining wind energy systems, and also the, the spatial um, structure of the wind fields for how across wind farms, how you aggregate where the wake effects of one, um, one turbine with another and how that the uncertainties may be reduced as you move to larger areas. So as my title suggested, we're interested in, in my group on looking across a range of time scales. And if we just take a snapshot or several snapshots of what's going on in the wind energy field, if you look at wind, product, wind production over 10 to 30 year project life cycle, there are investment and siting decisions where they're looking at what is the total energy production potential for a certain site. Now, th those are driven by large scale pressure fields, wind fields that vary with the climate and potentially change. On the time scales of minutes to hours or days, you have issues of um, grid management, how you dispatch your generation mix, trading of, of energy, um, how you take things offline for maintenance. And that's driven more by typical meteorology as we all experience as storms pass through um, over minutes to hours. From seconds to minutes, there, in fact, there are decisions about um, more automated on the turbine, how you, can close, how you um, control the pitch of the blades and things. And th they need to have lead time forecasts of seconds to minutes, and that's driven by the, the turbulent fluctuations. And what's become re relatively clear in the climate literature is while the general circulation models have done traditionally poor at, at predictions about rainfall, the one thing where the models tend to agree across each other is in predictions of changes in the pressure fields. And as we know, it's those pressure fields that drive the winds. So there is something deterministic we can take from those and use that. So if we just take a, a little cartoon here. This is looking at the variance in wind fluctuations. And these are time scales. So we see on this long time scale, we have the synoptic peak of the, the fronts passing, then the diurnal energy peak, and then the turbulent peak. And on this left side, we have an approach we're working on where these pressure gradients, that's a force driving the flow, is balanced by a shear stress at the surface. And so that shear stress is relatively easy to predict from the pressure. And whereas in the typical approaches in the power industry, they're trying to predict the actual wind speed. But as we see here, the wind speed depends on that, that shear stress, depends on the local roughness, depends on the stability. So we're trying to scale things down from the pressure to the friction velocity or the shear stress and from that to the velocity, and, and it seems to be working fairly well. So what's typically done now is traders and operators have a, a set of ad hoc prediction tools. At the shortest time scales, they're all data driven, machine learning. They're learning um, empirical rules from the data. Medium time scales, they're trying to use meteorological forecast models. And on the long time, they're just, again, data driven from the wind atlases. Errors, not based on the capacity of the generator, but as a fraction of the energy actually produced in wind energy, the errors are about 30 to 50%. So there's a lot of room for improvement here. And these errors, as you can imagine, weaken the economics and sort of tipping point for where wind energy can move in. The other problem with this current state of the art is progress on any one of these time scales is not going to accrue to the others because they're ad hoc and they're dealt with separately. And we're trying to work across those. So what we're working on in our group is a new multi-scale approach where we treat all the important dynamic time scales, and the statistical parameters at one given scale, like the, the variance at the daily scale, is controlled or modulated by dynamical processes at the slower scales, by the larger scale meteorology or by the climate. And we have these parameters cascading. So therefore, the non-stationarity or the trends are treated explicitly using both deterministic and stochastic principles. 
and this is coming from a, a field out of um, statistical physics referred to as super statistics. And just before concluding here, this is a log transform probability density function of wind speed, and this is of the friction velocity u star, and these are models of it. And we get improved fit just by, instead of fitting the wind speed, we fit the friction velocity. But what we notice here, if we separate and stratify the wind speeds for periods with high atmospheric pressure or low atmospheric pressure, we get two very different probability density functions. So if instead of taking a statistical approach, purely homogeneous statistics, we condition first on what type of a pressure system we're in, we have improved fit. So basically, that's the last slide. That's what we're working on is an effort to, to borrow this from this field of super statistics and to fit it into climate timescales driving meteorological timescales and meteorological timescales driving turbulent timescales. And then we use conditional probabilities to do that. And we're trying to eat into that 30 to 50 percent error and trying to have an approach that will be useful from the operations point of view, the trading point of view, and even to the siting and the long-term investment decisions.